And the story of the forgotten God, the rising, the tragic neglect of the Holy Spirit, is by Francis Chan. He's trying to convince that the church has a problem with connecting with the Holy Spirit of God. I've got Jesus. Why do I need the Spirit? I'm convinced that there is a desperate need in church for the Holy Spirit of God to be given room to have his way. I think we can agree that there is a problem in our churches, that something is wrong, but I don't think we can reach an agreement on what to do about it. Most people do not connect what is missing or wrong with a particular need for the Holy Spirit. A while back, our lack of openness to examine ourselves, especially in the area of the Holy Spirit, really hit me. Two of whole witnesses knocked on my door, an initial conversation. I had a lot to do, so I prepared to send them on their way. But as they began their spell, I decided to take a few minutes and engage them. I usually told them that I found their teachings about Jesus offensive because they taught that Jesus was the same person as Michael and Archangel. I told them that I believe he is much more than one among many angels, that I believe he is God. My visitors replied, No, Jesus, Michael is the only Archangel. There are no other Archangels. So I asked them to open their Bibles to Daniel 10 and 13, which reads, The Prince of Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. I pointed out this passage. It's clear. Michael is the only one of the chief prince or archangel. This caught them off guard. They told me they had never heard or read this before. Now that I had their attention, I said, there's no way you can look me in the eyes and tell me that you sat down one day seeking to find God. Read the Bible and, and came to the conclusion that Jesus is the same person as Michael, the archangel. No one could come to that conclusion. You only believe it because that's what you were told. I don't want to stand here and spin and spoon feed you something else. With that, I challenged them to read the Bible from themselves, rather than simply accept what they have been told about it. They went away that day and said they would consider doing that. I left that conversation feeling a bit proud of myself because I stumped them and got them to question their beliefs, yet I couldn't help but wonder whether I was fair to them. Had I ever sat down with the Bible and saw after his self-evident truth, or had I passively ingested what I heard from other people, much like my front door visitors? It was then that I began reading the scriptures as though I had never read them before. I asked the Spirit to make them living and active to me. Though I have been reading them for years, I asked God to penetrate the wrong and ill-conceivable -con notions I collected along the way. Hebrews 4 and 12, NIV. It's a great exercise for those of us who have been immersed in a church culture for years. There are, of course, dangers in this sense. The Bible is meant to be interpreted within the context and accountability of faithful community. Yet even when that qualification, there is still a need up for those of us now so deep within the Christian bubble to look beyond the status quo, a critically assess the degree to which we are really living biblically. Most of us assure that what we believe is right. Of course we do. It is why we believe what we believe but have n never really studied for ourselves. We were simply told, this is the way it is, and didn't question it. The problem, the problem is much of what we believe is often based more on comfort or our culture's tradition than on the Bible. I believe we need to re-examine our faith just as much as the Jehovah Witnesses who came to my door and need to re reconsider theirs. Remember, the Bereans were lifted up as good examples because they questioned the things they were taught. They made sure that even the apostles' teachings were in line with what was written. Now the Bereans were a more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness. And examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Acts 17, 11, and IV. Recently I was asked, who is the most spirit-filled person you know? My response Joni Erickson Tag. In 1967, driving accident left him. 17 year old Joni, a quadriplegic lattic, lying in a hospital bed. She was filled with overwhelming desire to end her life. The thought of spending the rest of her years paralyzed from neck down and relying on others to care for her basic needs were stagnating. But Joni did not end her life that day. Instead, she chose to surrender it to God. Little did she know that the Spirit of God would transform her into one of the godless women 
ever to grace this earth. God gave her a humanity and love that enables her to look beyond her pain and to see others' hurts. She is a person who consistently and humanly counts others more significant than herself, an embodiment of Philippians 2 and 3. I don't even know where to begin with all that she has done. While undergoing two years of rehabilitation after the accident, she spent many hours learning to paint with a brush held between her teeth. Her detailed paintings and prints are now highly sought after. Her international best-selling autobiography, Joni, was later made into a full-length feature film. She found Joni and friends in 1979 to increase Christian mystery to the disabled community throughout the world. The organization led to the establishment in 2007 of Joni and Friends International Disability Center, which currently impacts thousands of families around the globe. Over the course of each week, more than a million people listen to her daily five-minute radio program, Joni and Friends. The organization she started serves hundreds of special needs families through family retreats across the nation. Through Wheels for the World, wheelchairs are collected nationwide, refurbished by inmates in several connect correctional facilities, and then shipped and donated to developing nations where, and whenever possible, physical therapists fit each chair to a disabled child or adult who's in need. As of 2008, Wheels for the World had completed distributed 52,342 wheelchairs to 102 countries and trained hundreds of missionaries, ministry, and community leaders, including people with disabilities. In 2005, Joni Erickson Pat was appointed to the Disability Adversary Committee of the U.S. State Department. She has worked with Dr. Condoleezza Rice on programs affecting disabled persons in the State Department and around the world. Joni has appeared twice on Larry King Live, sharing not only her Christian testimony, but a biblical perspective on right to life issues that affect our nation's disabled population. And on top of all that, Joni has written more than 35 books. Yet it's not because of those of these accomplishments that I consider her the most spirit-filled person. I know. Actually, it has nothing to do with all she has accomplished. It has to do with the fact that you can't spend 10 minutes with Joni before she breaks out in song. <laughs> Quote scripture, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or share the touching time and word of encouragement. I'm glad that you're here with me today. You're a great friend. I have never seen the fruit of the Spirit more obviously displayed in a person's life as when I'm with Joni. I can't seem to have a conversation with Joni without shedding tears. It's because Joni is a person whose life at every level gives evidence of the Spirit's work in and through her.